Welcome to the lecture, The Constitution and Racial Repair by Joy Milligan, who is the Fall 2021 Ellen Maria Gorison Fellow in History here at the American Academy in Berlin. The fellowship was established in 2001 and over the past 20 years has, has made it possible for approximately 40 outstanding thinkers to come to the Academy for a residency here in Berlin. Ellen Maria Gorison herself was a journalist and the daughter of Hans Arnold, after whom these premises, in which we are, are named. Born in 1916, she and her family emigrated to the United States via Paris after the Nazis took power. The villa we find ourselves in tonight was her family home. Ellen Maria Gorison passed away in 1996, shortly before the American Academy was founded. But the Arnold family and its descendants remain the Academy's most prolific benefactors to this day, and for this we are immensely grateful. In both Germany and the United States, the question of whether and how historical injustices can be reconciled has emerged at the center of public debate in many different contexts. We thus um, are even more excited to have Joy Milligan here with us uh, this fall. Not only is Joy a very wonderful person, uh, wonderfulness is not enough uh, to qualify for a fellowship, um, although she has a lot of that, um, but she is an expert uh, on the intersection of law and inequality and especially race-based economic inequality, a topic that continues to need urgent attention. Tonight, um, Joy will explore the US government's historical role in racial segregation and subordination and how this legacy might be repaired. Joy, thank you so much for accepting this fellowship, for being here, um, for coming not alone, but bringing a wonderful family. Um, you, are, you are what I call the buy one, get one free model. It's perfect for us. Uh, we just have to give you one room and get so much more back. Um, before we begin, I would like to introduce a very special guest who will say a few words about Joy via video message. Um, this person is Richard Rothstein. Richard is a distinguished fellow at the Economic Policy Institute and a senior fellow emeritus at the Thurgood Marshall Institute of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. He has performed groundbreaking work on the history of segregation in the United States, especially in the context of housing and education. His works on these topics include his 2004 book, Class and Schools, Using Social, Economic and Educational Reform to Close Black-White achieve, Achievement Gap, and his 2008 book, Gra Grading Education, Getting Accountability Right. With these two books alone, Richard has made an invaluable contribution, or I should say contributions, to the study of education policy and how it can be improved. In German, we would probably call him something like an exceptional Urgestein. Um, however, I cannot neglect to mention his most recent book, The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. It was published in 2017. In it, Richard examines the local, state, and federal housing policies that mandated segregation. This landmark book was one of the 10 finalists of the, of the National Book Awards long list for the best nonfiction book of 2017. William Julius Wilson called it, and I quote, the most forceful argument ever published on how federal, state, and local governments gave rise to and reinforced neighborhood segregation. And um, Jeffrey R. Stone called the implication of this book simply revolutionary. Um, to end the praises, um, I uh, will quote one other person who referred to the book or who said about uh, its contents, the book, uh, and I quote again, the American landscape will never look the same to readers of this important work, book. Um, I truly cannot think of any other person who would be um, better suited to introduce Joy. Um, Richard, um, who <laughs> I don't really know where to look at this moment, um, <laughs> before I um, give the screen to him or to the video, let me briefly say a few words. 
about the procedure for uh, tonight's Q&A um, after Joyce's lecture. Um, all of who, you who are here in the room, you simply raise your hand and uh, Joy will answer your question, uh, if she can. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, for everyone else who's joining us via Zoom, uh, please uh, type in your questions um, in the Q&A icon below on the screen and um, I will uh, read those questions uh, to Joy. Um, thank you so much, Joy, again. It's an honor um, to have you here. And now I'm supposed to press the button, which I will do. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm a researcher and writer in the fields of race and education. Uh, some years ago, I came to the conclusion that the biggest single problem facing public education in this country was the segregation of its schools, and that schools are segregated primarily because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. So I began to look into neighborhood segregation as an educational policy issue. In 2010, I was a fellow at the Research Institute in Berkeley, California, and my next door neighbor uh, in the office next to mine was Joy Milligan, recently a lawyer for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and she was working on a brief asserting that a disparate impact of policies, that is policies that um, affected African-Americans in a disadvantageous way relative to whites, even though they weren't racially explicit policies, that disparate impact would be a violation of the Fair Housing Act. I knew nothing about this kind of theory before, but I spent many hours with her educating me about this. I recall many lunches uh, reading her drafts and it immersed me in the theory of uh, ongoing effects of racial discrimination that had been created by public policy many years ago. And with that background, uh, I wrote a book called The Color of Law that uh, uh, described the ongoing effects of racially discriminatory policies that were explicitly adopted in the 20th century by federal, state, and local governments, but that now no longer were racially explicit, but still had a very powerful effect. Well, Joy is now embarked on a um, mission that I think is cutting edge and will have an enormous impact on the way in which we attempt to redress the racial segregation that uh, we, our government, uh, has created. The current Supreme Court, uh, has no interest in racially explicit remedies to redress segregation. It takes the view that the end way to end the discrimination is to not to talk about it, to not to recognize it, to pretend that ongoing policies that are race neutral can themselves undo the really apartheid uh, system uh, that we have in this country and that Joy is trying to figure out how to challenge. Uh, she's a lawyer, I'm not. And so she's primarily looking at ways to um, really erode current Supreme Court doctrine to, um, uh, that prevents the redress of segregation. Uh, I'm a journalist, I'm willing to go much farther. I'm uh, in favor of defying the Supreme Court, of uh, forcing it to, um, uh, ad to address challenges to its authority in this area. Uh, the Supreme Court, uh, as you probably know, uh, throughout American history has been repressing uh, the civil rights of African-Americans as well as civil liberties of all Americans. The only uh, period when it wasn't doing so was the 15 year period uh, of the Warren Court from 1954 to 1969. And many people my age and even younger have a fantasy that the Supreme Court can return to that uh, stance it took in that very narrow 15 year period, which is an exception to its role throughout American history uh, to repress the civil rights and liberties of Americans, particularly those of African-Americans. Uh, in 1857, the Supreme Court issued a decision, uh, the Dred Scott decision, in which it uh, uh, declared that African-Americans had no rights as citizens, even in free states. Racial justice advocates at those ta that time, uh, not just abolitionists, but people like Abraham Lincoln, who, um, were um, not in favor of challenging slavery directly, uh, 
but of eroding its power gradually by first preventing its expansion into the territories. People like Abraham Lincoln and Republicans throughout the North defied the Supreme Court. They said its decision was wrongly decided, uh, that they weren't going to honor it, and they took a number of steps in open defiance of Supreme Court doctrine. Uh, New York, for example, immediately after the Dred Scott decision uh, issue, they uh, passed a law expanding the voting rights of African Americans as a direct challenge to the Supreme Court's authority. Joy Milligan is not about to go that far, but she's leading up to it, and I think will have an enormous impact on the way in which we think of remedies to racial segregation. Her disparate impact uh, research and um, scholarship that influenced me so much later helped me write a, uh, an amicus brief for a subsequent Supreme Court case. The one that she was working on had been settled, so her brief was never filed, but I worked on an amicus brief uh, subsequently that the Supreme Court uh, cited uh, in its decision in 2015 to um, uh, uphold the, the right of um, the Fair Housing Act to enforce uh, uh, disparate impact uh, uh, issues and prevent policies that had a disparate impact on African Americans, even though they weren't um, racially explicit. Uh, Joy probably doesn't recognize the powerful uh, indirect effect she had on that decision, but we owe a great deal to her, I do, especially personally. Uh, there are many uh, ways in which uh, lawyers can begin to approach uh, the issue of uh, racially explicit uh, remedies to redress segregation. Uh, there is one uh, law that is beginning to be used that will undoubtedly lead to challenges. It's uh, something that per permits uh, special purpose credit programs and a number of uh, institutions are beginning to use it now and um, uh, waiting for challenges that will inevitably be filed. And Joy Milligan's research will undoubtedly be of enormous support to the institutions, the government agencies, and the uh, private institutions that are stepping up to the edge of what the Supreme Court will permit by adopting policies under this program. In short, I think her research is going to have an enormous impact in this country. Uh, I look forward to reading the book on which she's working, but I've had the privilege of reading some of the material she's writing that leads up to it. It's very exciting to me. and. Um, I'm very uh, privileged and honored to be able to introduce her to present more about it. Thank you very much. Is it slideshow? Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening. Thank you so much uh, to Richard for that introduction. Over a decade ago, when I first met him, I argued that people did remember that the federal government had explicitly created residential segregation, um, but that the courts just did not care. The success of his book, which has um, gotten so much renown, The Color of Law, proved me wrong, uh, on the first count at least. People do care, but as... Uh, as Richard questioned, and as I will discuss tonight, it remains to be seen how much the courts do. Um, I may not go so far as recommending Supreme Court defiance, as he noted, but in fact, one man's uh, defiance is another man's test case. So uh, thank you to Barrett also for your introduction, uh, to everyone at the American Academy, including the staff and the board, uh, for the work you put into uh, to make this evening happen and to doing everything that you do that makes this such a special place. I, along with all the other fellows, am so grateful and especially grateful that you continue this work during an ongoing global pandemic. Thank you also to my fellow fellows for creating such a warm and supportive community. Uh, it's my honor to be the Ellen Maria Gorison Fellow this fall. Thank you to the Arnold family for making all of this possible. So my talk tonight is about the legacy of Jim Crow in the United States and how we might repair it. 
Even as the country is extremely polarized, nonetheless, it seems that increasing numbers of people uh, understand the need to address US, the U.S.'s devastating history of racial violence and subordination against African Americans and other racial minorities. At the Academy, I've been working on a book project that focuses on one aspect of this. In the project, I foreground a key but still understudied actor, the federal government, during one key period from the uh, New Deal through roughly the civil rights era of the 1960s. Tonight, my talk is titled The Constitution and Racial Repair, and I will focus on the federal government's responsibility to repair the constitutional harms it committed over many decades. That's the first sense in which I plan to speak about the Constitution. I'll discuss how the federal government, uh, the specific ways in which it violated the Constitution, and how little has been done to repair those wrongs. But I'll also talk about the Constitution in a second sense, as an impediment to racial repair, including as a potential barrier to steps that the federal government might conceivably take to address the legacies of its involvement in Jim Crow. For more than 40 years, we've seen the federal courts in the United States striking down racial remedies like affirmative action programs as forms of reverse discrimination against whites. So any program of repair must address that potential constitutional obstacle. And I should note that I focus on the Constitution because my value added in this domain is as a legal and historical scholar as Richard highlights. And I also approach this with a sense of humility as a white woman in this domain. I can't ultimately judge whether any particular program constitutes full reparations for the worst harms of Jim Crow uh, because I haven't experienced those wrongs directly or as a descendant of those who did. Instead, my aim is to document the harms of the past as a legal historian and point to how the law supports or hinders particular forms of repair. So a brief roadmap of the talk is as, as follows. Uh, first, I'll talk about federally funded apartheid, how the federal government specifically uh, supported segregated institutions across the nation with legal backing and federal funds, even after it moved to eradicate segregation within its own operations. Um, and just let me pause here with a brief note on what I mean by Jim Crow. Um, I mean not just that system of separation, but one that was of exclusion, exploitation, degradation, violence that systematically devalued black lives, blocked access to economic and human capital through severely unequal or no access to jobs, credit, education, health care, etc., um, and existed in both the American North and South, albeit in somewhat different forms. I use Jim Crow or sometimes apartheid as a label, a shorthand for all of those facets of that interlocking and pervasive system of racial caste. So second, I will then turn to the Constitution and federally funded apartheid, um, sketching out the legal fight that civil rights activists took to, uh, undertook to prove that this uh, background federal support for Jim Crow also violated the Constitution, uh, just as uh, de jure segregation itself did. Uh, that history matters because it provides a legal foundation for seeking remedies now. Then I'll turn to the Constitution and the remedies of the past. I'll give an overview of what legal and voluntary remedies uh, have sought to achieve, what has actually been implemented to address Jim Crow, and why that process of repair has been so incomplete. Then finally, I'll turn to the Constitution and remedies now, what remedies for federal support for segregation might look like, um, and what the Constitution would allow. To give you a sense of where we'll end up, the bottom line is that the Constitution, as currently interpreted, uh, blocks anything like complete repair. Uh, but it does leave some room for significant measures that could be taken uh, now. So why focus on the federal government in particular? What could possibly be distinctive here that we don't already understand about the history of American apartheid? For many people, the core image of the Jim Crow era in the United States remains one of racism playing out in an immediate, visceral, face-to-face -face interaction. Vicious Southern sheriffs, biased voting registrars, white supremacist violence. State and local officials play an outsized role in those scenes, as in this photograph when Alabama uh, Governor George Wallace in 1963 stood in the schoolhouse door, as he put it, to block the integration of the University of Alabama. 
In this photograph, the man standing opposite uh, Wallace is Deputy uh, uh, Attorney General Nicholas Katzenbach, thereby representing the Federal Justice Department, which itself sought the integration of the university. Thus, the federal government stands for the cause of racial justice, visually here, just as it does in many people's imagination and collective memory. Because of the prominence of vicious racism perpetrated by state and local officials, the role of the federal government has often been perceived as neutral at worst. That vision is also rooted in the structure of US federalism, which locates authority for most day-to-day -day governance in the states, leaving the federal government to operate and uh, uh, in so only selected areas granted to it directly under the Constitution and by using indirect tools of governance. The federal, roles, uh, the federal government's role in uh, structuring public life thus remains less visible. Also, the federal government began to racially integrate its own operations before the Supreme Court explicitly required it and before the major developments of the civil rights era of the 1950s and 60s. Thus, President Truman in the 1940s ordered the military and federal civil service to integrate. His Justice Department took the side of the NAACP in major cases, continuing a pattern that had begun under Franklin Roosevelt's administration. Eisenhower, though reluctant to embrace integration, did encourage the military and other federal actors to continue desegregation, and his Justice Department famously backed the NAACP and Brown v. Board of Education, uh, as you all know, the key case in validating de jure segregation as a violation of the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Thus, by the 1960s, the federal government appeared as an active ally of civil rights, often joining the NAACP or even pursuing civil rights claims itself uh, once it gained new enhanced litigation powers under the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Recently, this picture uh, of the federal government intervening on the side of racial justice and civil rights has begun to be adjusted. Collective memory has begun to be corrected. For example, leading authors and journalists uh, like ta Coates and Richard Rothstein have called our attention to the role of the federal government's agencies in creating racial, racial segregation beginning in the 1930s. As many of you know, redlining is the name for when lenders refuse to provide mortgages uh, to particular areas of a city based on the race of that area's residents on the premise that those communities are unworthy of credit. The name comes from the fact that federal agencies, like the Homeowners Loan Corporation, created maps encircling black, majority black and integrated neighborhoods uh, in red and urging lenders to categorize those neighborhoods as high risk, not to be invested in. So thus the backdrop um, of one such redlining map on Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law. Those practices, which spread throughout the federal housing agencies, helped entrench racial segregation, prevent black and other minority families from accumulating household wealth, and expose those communities to severe economic exploitation. That story of the early federal role in racial residential segregation is becoming well known thanks to books like The Color of Law. Nonetheless, the extent of the federal role in backstopping, encouraging, and extending Jim Crow practices throughout the United States and across many sectors of public life, not simply through its interventions in housing, remains poorly understood, especially at a popular level and even among lawyers and law professors, my own scholarly community. To understand why the federal government played such a role and why that role has often been opaque and poorly understood, we have to return to the history of the American administrative state, or what we might think of as the US social welfare state, um, as well as recognize how federalism operates in the United States. Um, the United States is known for having an incomplete, weak, stingy, and fragmented welfare state compared to Western Europe or other wealthy uh, developed nations. Even the existence of that that we have, such as it is, only came about after grave political and constitutional battles uh, in what's known as our New Deal after the Great Depression. Uh, because our Constitution allocates most governing power to states, the creation of national programs to support workers, farmers, the poor, the elderly, and others was deeply controversial, both politically and legally. Some conservatives still view this creation of a national welfare state as unconstitutional. 
Thus, I show you the text here of the 10th Amendment to the US Constitution, which stands for this idea that all governing power, not specifically delegated to the federal government in Article I or other parts of the Constitution, all remaining power stays with the states. In the New Deal, the constitutional compromise that emerged was to allow the federal government to create such programs, so long as it framed them in a very particular way, as resting on conditional gifts of federal money to the states, ones which states, in their full sovereignty, could theoretically refuse. Uh, in theory, much of the national welfare state rests on voluntary participation by the states in exchange for federal dollars, uh, and thus, this explains why, for example, in the present, uh, some states still have not uh, taken up the invitation to expand their health care coverage through Medicaid. The photo is of one uh, early such piece of social welfare legislation, uh, President Roosevelt signing the Social Security Act in 1935. States also had to operate these programs when they consisted of more than simply dispersing direct payments to individuals. Even in instances where the federal government provided almost all or all, all or all, um, almost all or all of the funding and tightly regulated the programs, the frontline management was still delegated to states or locality. The theory was that the Constitution barred our federal government from, for example, directly running public housing or hospitals or schools. Uh, these were areas reserved to the states and localities. So the federal government since then has operated across the nation in this indirect, less visible way, shaping our country in overwhelming ways across multiple areas of public life, but doing so through the mechanism of federal spending accompanied by intricate regulations. That mode of power is, of course, much less visible to the average person, a, a form of what some have called the, quote, submerged state. That mode of power was decisive in shaping 20th century and present day America. And of course, it indelibly shaped the pattern of racial subordination in the United States. The graph to the left is just a visual depiction of this, um, the massive growth of federal funding as a source of uh, revenue for state and local governments during the period from the early 20th century uh, through 1960. So, as major federal social programs were shaped in this era, and as these institutions uh, uh, took uh, practical form, Southern Democrats were a key, critical, pivotal part of the political coalition supporting these programs. Their votes were necessary to overcome opposition from conservatives and business interests who branded these social uh, supports as socialism. As many of you may know, the price that those uh, Southern Democrats and other supporters of white supremacy extracted was to require that federal money support Jim Crow in South and North at times. And in fact, that pattern predates even those 20th century negotiations. It begins with the Second Moral Act of uh, 1890, which added uh, augmented federal funding for the land-grant university system. Um, but ex that legislation explicitly permitted such funding to flow to whites-only universities in the South, so long as purportedly separate but equal institutions were created for African Americans. Thus, the South had a segregated land-grant university system uh, from the beginning, which then served as the foundation for an entire system of segregated federal farm programs, such that black farmers concentrated in the South had minimal access to the far-reaching subsidies that white farmers did, just one element in the broad New Deal uh, program of social supports. Uh, this uh, land-grant-led segregation also drastically, of course, limited African Americans' ability to access higher education when, those, uh, when the black land-grant universities that were located in the South were systematically starved of resources, even as they relied uh, in significant part on federal funds. Similar patterns characterized most other federal social programs. For example, the U.S. Employment Service offices, uh, a system uh, that persists in, in uh, revised form today, were organized to help people find work and vocational training. Um, they were segregated and discriminatory throughout the South. Money for hospitals and health systems under the Hill-Burton Act was authorized to be used for whites-only hospitals, again with a legislative clause that uh, uh, created a, um, a supposed but unenforced requirement that separate but equal health care be provided for non-whites. Uh, 
Local schools that served large numbers of federal military or other federal employee children received what, we, what was called and still is called federal impact aid. That money was used to build and maintain segregated schools. Federal housing agencies, as I've already mentioned, were flagrant in their support for Jim Crow, approving and funding segregated public housing in both the North and the South while encouraging redlining and providing financial backing for the building of whites-only suburbs like the uh, Levittown uh, developments of the Northeast. The key then is to understand just how sweeping and pervasive federal backing for Jim Crow was across all sectors. The funding invested was significant, and it flowed to de jure segregated institutions without hesitation, both before and after the federal government's Justice Department began arguing that segregation violated the Constitution. It also con um, flowed before and after the Supreme Court upheld that position that segregation violated the 14th Amendment in Brown in 1954. When the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights demanded that President Kennedy halt these practices in 1961, they pointed out that in the prior year, more than $1 billion uh, of federal funds uh, in then dollars uh, had flowed to the states of the Confederacy, practicing still overt segregation. Uh, and so the slide shows uh, just a quick visual depiction of the ever increasing amount of federal funds that did flow to those states in, the, in that decade between 1954 and 1964. Um, that was also a significant portion of their budgets, even then, even as federal funding has uh, you know, uh, exponentially grown even since those years. Back then, for states like Mississippi, it was nearly a quarter of their budget. Uh, even flowing to them in years when the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, as in 1963, reported that the state was participating in systematic denial of constitutional rights, brutality, and terror. So why did this happen? Federal agencies were not oblivious to the fact that there were significant constitutional problems with approving and funding segregation. Rather, agencies like the Department of Agriculture, uh, or the Public Housing Administration, or what was then the uh, Office of Education, had been designed to coexist with these systems. And in fact, their political survival, their funding, and their maintenance um, uh, in terms of uh, their legislative continuance depended on congressional Democrats from the South. So it is in light of those incentives, in some ways it's not surprising, uh, but lawyers in the Public Housing Administration, for example, wrote a memo on the effects of Brown on their funding of segregated housing just a couple of weeks after the decision, um, in which they announced that local housing authorities may in fact continue to follow the laws and decisions of their own states, i.e. the Jim Crow laws. Um, and court rulings in subsequent decades found that the, the Public Housing Administration continued to fund explicitly segregated housing through at least the end of the 1970s in, um, at, in at least some areas. The Civil Rights Commission similarly noted that in the 10 years after um, Brown, the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture had continued to embrace segregation in its farm programs. Um, as in their words, its prevailing practice had been to follow local patterns of segregation uh, in providing assistance paid for by federal funds. None of this escaped the attention of civil rights activists. They consistently argued that the Constitution barred the federal government from collaborating in segregation and discrimination. From the 1930s forward, the NAACP challenged federal agencies to stop funding Jim Crow. Thurgood Marshall, uh, the lawyer who famously argued Brown and became the first black Supreme Court justice, um, seen here on the left, wrote memos to the president uh, to multiple presidents arguing that the federal agency's support for housing segregation violated equal protection guarantees. In the legislative arena, Adam Clayton Powell Jr., the first uh, black Congress member from New York um, who uh, represented Harlem, he is seen here uh, uh, second from the left of the, the photograph on the right, uh, 
he became famous for proposing repeatedly, year after year, session after session, statutory prohibitions on discrimination in these federally funded social programs. His repeated proposals became known as the Powell Amendment. Um, leading, they were seen as a poison pill. Leading liberal uh, liberals from the North voted against them, even as they claimed to support civil rights, on the ground that such prohibitions simply would lead to the defeat of the legislation. Those could not be enacted without white Southern votes. Clarence Mitchell, the longtime representative for the NAACP in its Washington, D.C. office, shown here on uh, the right of Adam Clayton Powell, uh, he led the charge to lobby the executive branch in Congress to acknowledge that funding segregation was unconstitutional. All of these efforts, which as I said, began in the 1930s, did not have uh, any success uh, to speak of until 1964, when, to the surprise of many, Title VI was enacted as part of the landmark Civil Rights Act of that year. That statute barred race discrimination in federally funded programs and gave agencies the power to cut off funds to discriminatory institutions. Meanwhile, the courts had also begun to recognize that federal funding for segregation or other forms of systemic race discrimination violated the Constitution. After decades of litigation, by 1980, the D.C. Circuit uh, Federal Court of Appeals could announce that this principle had become, finally, clearly established constitutional law. Those rulings and the legislation vindicated the moral claim that had been made all along. The federal taxpayers' money paid by those of all races should not flow only to benefit whites or to re reinforce racial hierarchy. Yet administrative inertia and loopholes kept federal funding flowing to segregated institutions well after the 1960s in some, if not um, many, instances. The federal institutions, their practices, and their legacies often remained resistant to reform. The litigation campaign that had been focused specifically on stopping federal involvement in Jim Crow also had succeeded just as the federal courts began to become far more conservative. That timing radically limited the remedies that could emerge for the federal government's long-term funding of segregation. So what should those remedies have looked like? Um, just to stop for a moment, I could spend, uh, you know, hours on, on this topic alone, so I'm simply highlighting the point, flagging it for us, um, that we are increasingly understanding the long-run implications and harms of Jim Crow, as research shows how far-reaching the impact of pervasive segregation, racial exclusion, violence, and subordination has been. Most scholars think that the combination of slavery and Jim Crow are largely responsible for the massive racial wealth gap in the United States. Uh, the chart to the right, again, just a visual depiction of uh, the size and widening uh, proportion of that white-black uh, wealth gap in the la over the last 70 years or so, um, in which at present, white wealth is at least eight times that of median black wealth in the United States and the figures for Latinx families are similar. Historic discrimination in the fields I've already mentioned blocked equitable access to jobs, schooling, healthcare, higher education, ownership of homes and land, other wealth generating opportunities. Um, and as a rich body of literature has shown, the impacts to uh, wealth, income, education, health and well-being for communities of color has been massive. Um, and increasingly, we're seeing specific attempts to quantify some of those impacts. Um, this requires careful work by economists to really nail it down and trace causality um, in a very specific way. Um, I just thought I'd flag a recent example from a former colleague of mine, Abe Anesia, and a co-author, who traced, um, it's the chart below, traced the impact of uh, racial segregation when it was introduced into the federal civil service by President Woodrow Wilson in the um, 1910s and found a significant drop in earnings for black federal workers um, as a result of the introduction of that segregation and subsequently connected it also to a drop in black owner, home ownership rates among the same group. Um, it's suggestive of the ways, but also the exhaustive work required uh, to trace how those Jim Crow systems uh, produce very specific harms. So let me turn now to this, 
uh, topic of the Constitution and remedies for segregation. It's necessary to understand first the court's twists and turns in shaping its remedial jurisprudence to understand how the Constitution interacts with the possibility of racial repair in the present. First, though, I want to give you a, a, a basic broad strokes framework for thinking about the goals and possible forms of remedies for constitutional violations and for racial harms more generally. Legal remedies, um, by which I mean the type that a court would order in response to a legal violation, uh, have at least two broad goals. One is to halt illegal practices, usually through an injunction. The second is to repair the harms. And in the civil rights context, some remedies have been targeted at the goal of what we call make whole relief, essentially returning the individual to the position they would have been in absent the harm. Often this requires translating injuries into economic terms and providing uh, those that suffered them with uh, monetary damages, but sometimes it can involve awarding them a job or some similar injunctive relief that accounts for the benefit that they had lost due to discrimination. The other aspect of civil rights remedies focuses on reforming institutions, using injunctions or consent decrees to massively overhaul uh, the ways in which inst prior um, discrimina institutions practicing racial discrimination in the past to change their practices, and change their internal patterns. Um, in the segregation context, this has meant integrating those institutions as well as attempting to compensate for underinvestment in majority minority institutions. In a sense, there too, the goal is to make the institutions whole, or at least to undo the constitutional harms stemming from Jim Crow. Other forms of remedies are ones that courts generally won't order, ones that have to be democratically enacted after social movement pressure. Things like truth-telling through historical investigations and reports documenting past wrongs, official apologies, monuments, correcting how history is taught, redistribution to address the cumulative impacts of past and present discrimination, and finally, insofar as white supremacy has shaped uh, our laws and institutions in ways that distribute polit political power and resources without being explicitly discriminatory, the final element one might think of as part of this remedial package is to consider how the mission, program, and powers of particular federal agencies, for example, um, need to be overhauled to bring them into line with racial justice goals. The key overall point here for now is simply that courts are limited to the remedial goals I list in the first section. And as I'll discuss uh, now, even the kinds of legal remedies aimed at overhauling institutions have become increasingly controversial and difficult to sustain. Um, in an initial era, for roughly a decade, from the late 1960s through the 1970s, we actually saw the US federal courts take a demanding <clears throat> stance towards institutional reform of de jure segregation. Um, after Brown, there had been pitched battles over how far the federal courts and federal government would go in undoing Jim Crow. Courts eventually, um, after uh, years of massive resistance by the southern states, they eventually upheld aggressive race-based remedies to shift the comp composition of public institutions. The place where that jurisprudence was most emphatic was in the school's context. By 1968, the court had announced that school districts had an affirmative duty to eliminate racial discrimination, quote, root and branch. In other words, they couldn't simply leave segregated schools in place as a matter of institutional inertia, but rather had to actively desegregate them. That responsibility, as the court announced in cases like those I outline here, Green, Swan, and Dayton Board of Education, was an ongoing duty. It didn't have a statute of limitations. It lasted until the vestiges of segregation had been eradicated. As part of this demanding jurisprudence, the court also approved race-based steps as a means to cure past constitutional violations. The court in Swan blessed the use of racial ratios um, as targets for su student integration across school districts. So it upheld a 71-29 uh, white-black integration goal for the schools uh, in that case, which was about the Charlotte 
uh, North Carolina schools. Um, in places like police and fire departments, the Supreme Court approved the use of numeric hiring and promotion ratios based on race to remedy long histories of whites-only employment. So in the U.S. v. Paradise case, um, they upheld such a one-to-one -one hiring and promotion ratio within the Alabama State Troopers, which uh, for approximately 40 years had never hired um, a single uh, black state trooper. So courts and governments through the 1980s constructed sweeping remedies for Jim Crow. They understood that changing the pattern of society, quote, unfreezing the status quo, as even uh, Chief Justice Warren Burger, appointed by Richard Nixon, as even he put it, um, unfreezing the status quo and any kind of shift in that dominant racial pattern of society required, as they put it, quote, affirmative action, by which they meant active efforts to reshape institutions. While those remedies were demanding, especially from today's perspective, it's important to note what they didn't include. They, uh, these, were, these institutional reform measures that followed Brown, uh, they were aimed at prospective remediation. They generally didn't involve compensating past victims of Jim Crow, but rather changing the way the institutions would operate and look in the future. While they emphasized institutional change, they left entirely unanswered the question of how to make individuals whole for the wrongs they'd suffered. People who had directly experienced the material, economic, and other harms of segregation, school children, workers, farmers, residents of segregated neighborhoods. Um, there are doctrinal reasons for those gaps, but it's important to note that even amidst kind of the, the, the peak of desegregation, that uh, measure, that idea of making individuals whole went unaddressed. Courts also did not order and governments generally did not take affirmative steps to commemorate and atone for Jim Crow uh, through uh, history, uh, the telling of official histories, the correction of official histories, monuments and other expressive means. As we now continue to see uh, the, the legacy of omission wrought there and the pitched battles over race in the public schools um, and over monuments and other symbols in public space. So those are significant gaps that existed in remedies at all levels of government. But for the federal government and its role in segregation, remedies were even more limited. Because the federal government had played that more indirect role in segregation, because it often allied with plaintiffs in civil rights litigation against state and local governments, and because the recognition that its behavior had violated the Constitution came relatively late, as the courts were already changing, uh, shifting in a more conservative direction, remedies for federal participation in Jim Crow were scarce and generally only came when the federal government was added as a defendant in suits against other entities as a way of enlisting uh, a federal agency in supporting institutional reforms. Uh, despite those inherent limits to those remedies, the um, these types of uh, uh, structural changes in response, structural remedies in response to Jim Crow were controversial from the beginning, both in the white mainstream and in the legal community. So beginning with uh, Richard Nixon's election to the presidency uh, in 1968, um, taking office in 69, Republicans increasingly became identified with opposition to active integration. Um, and they both fueled, uh, were fueled by and fed white backlash against these uh, remedies. Um, that backlash and the political realignment associated with it fueled a conservative takeover of the federal courts. Uh, Republicans dominated the U.S. presidency from uh, Nixon through the first George Bush in those 24 years, 24-year uh, period. We had one Democratic president. Um, Reagan alone appointed nearly half of the federal judiciary by the end of his two terms. The last time the Supreme Court, even through the present, has had a majority of Democratic appointees was 1969. So as a result, by the 1990s, uh, the Supreme Court began to create serious constitutional barriers to racial remedies. Conservatives uh, struck down and restricted affirmative action programs by all levels of government. Perversely, in the eyes of many, conservatives used the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Guarantee, 
uh, the U.S. Constitution's uh, primary constitutional safeguard against racial discrimination adopted to eradicate uh, the traces of the Dred Scott decision that Richard Rothstein uh, alluded to, um, it was adopted to eradicate that decision from our Constitution and assure equal citizenship to African Americans after the Civil War. But that amendment has been used by conservatives as a basis for invalidating attempts at racial integration and uh, remediation. Uh, they argued that, in fact, equal protection was best understood as a guarantee that required government to be colorblind in all its operations. Uh, in the photo, um, this is uh, Ronald Reagan with his attorney general, Edwin Meese, well known for leading the Justice Department during uh, these years to adopt that position against racial remedies, um, thus shifting dramatically from a prior position of uh, seeking race-based remedies in civil rights cases uh, to opposing them, uh, leading the Justice Department to in fact literally switch sides in some ongoing legal battles uh, from the plaintiff's side to that of defendants. Um, some of you may remember me, Scott, the uh, uh, Federal uh, Medal of Honor, a Presidential Medal of Honor from Trump uh, in 2019. Um, so uh, two key cases from that era still govern the ability of courts and government actors to use race in attempts to remedy inequality and change the institutional status quo. The court had adopted what we uh, call, quote, strict scrutiny for intentional government uses of race already in landmark cases like Loving v. Virginia, which struck down a state ban on interracial marriage. Uh, it announced that only the most compelling of government goals could justify the use of race uh, in legislation or official action. In a world where Jim Crow laws survived, that demanding level of scrutiny for racial classifications meant striking down de jure segregation. But in a world where racial remedies took on increasing importance, conservatives had begun to argue, as I've noted, these racial remedies were a form of racial classification just like Jim Crow laws that had to be subjected to strict scrutiny also. Liberals, of course, opposed this, uh, fearing that such actions would invalidate almost all attempts by government to fix racial inequality. Not until the 1990s did the court finally provide a definitive answer. Um, conservative justices, now in the majority, agreed that the same level of scrutiny had to apply not just to de jure segregation, but also to attempts to remedy the effects of that system. In City of Richmond v. J.A. Croson Company, the court considered Richmond, Virginia's use of racial preferences uh, to choose government contractors. The city, the former capital of the Confederacy, uh, had asked its contractors to work with at least 30% minority subcontractors after finding that over 99% of its construction uh, contracts had flown to whites. Um, Justice O'Connor, the swing vote on the court in those years, explained that even, quote, benign remedial uses of race had to satisfy strict scrutiny. They had to serve a compelling government uh, purpose and be narrowly tailored towards that end. And she explained why. She said that absent searching inquiry, there's simply no way of telling whether such classifications are in fact benign or remedial, or whether they're uh, motivated by illegitimate notions of racial inferiority or simple racial politics. Six years later, she wrote again for the court in Adirond Constructors v. Pena, a case challenging the federal government's similar program, which provided financial incentives for contractors to hire minority subcontractors. Again, the majority confirmed that all government remedial uses of race had to withstand strict scrutiny. So why treat remedies in the same manner as Jim Crow? To the conservatives, they would argue, in Justice Roberts' words, that the, quote, the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. To many of us, uh, this rationale makes no sense. Um, but I, I am not tonight focusing on the many fundamental critiques of that conservative view, uh, which legal scholars, among others, have laid out at great length and for many decades now. At present, the court has likely at least six votes against changing that basic framework. So this is the constitutional law we have for now. And I will assume that for now, it's here to stay.
So what does strict scrutiny require? As I've mentioned, uh, it's a two-part test. It requires that any race-based government program serve a compelling interest. Uh, it also requires that the court decide that the means adopted to pursue that goal are, quote, narrowly tailored. In other words, closely calibrated and matched the goal in question. Outside of higher education, the only interest that the court has deemed compelling, uh, sufficiently compelling to justify race-based remedies, is that of interest here in addressing past federal racial harms, the goal of remedying past discrimination. Um, so that's good news in a limited way. Uh, theoretically, the Constitution will allow for at least some forms of racial repair. The bad news is that those requirements are, in fact, extremely demanding to meet. Even before we consider whether the federal government could withstand constitutional barriers to enacting measures aid aimed at racial repair, I want to stop for a critical point uh, that opens the door to certain kinds of remedial measures without strict scrutiny. Um, Race-based prospective measures that trigger strict scrutiny, the kinds that were addressed in the court's affirmative action cases, weren't in fact attempts to make whole prior victims of discrimination in any specific targeted way. way. Their goal in those cases was to change the composition and practice of the institutions going forward. They used race alone or in conjunction with other factors as a way of determining who to select for school attendance purposes or for police academy slots. That's what we mean by race space. The selection doesn't require anyone to show that they suffered past harms, because at least in those settings, the goal is partly to compensate for the past, but it's more dominantly to change the institution going forward for purposes of prospective inclusion. In the process of changing the institution, it may well provide some forms of repair. It provides benefits to members of those communities, but it doesn't seek to target those specifically touched by the institution's past discrimination. Justice Scalia, um, I, the former um, uh, Supreme Court justice, uh, wrote, uh, known as one of the most conservative members of the court, most opposed to racial, uh, race, what he considered racial preferences, uh, wrote in that Croson case that nothing prevented the city from according contracting preferences to identified victims of discrimination. He says, while most of the beneficiaries of such a preference might be black, neither those beneficiaries nor those disadvantaged by the preferences would be identified on the basis of their race. His point is that offering remedies to identified victims of discrimination is not race-based at all, and therefore does not trigger strict scrutiny. That opens the door to offering more targeted forms of repair that are not race-based at all, as such as the court understands it, but based on whether um, a person has been impacted or that person's ancestors have been impacted by documented forms of discrimination. It might well extend further to whether um, a particular institution has been impacted by, uh, by segregation, uh, as well as communities. Um, and another important aspect to note on this question of the opening is that aggressive remedies for formerly segregated institutions, ones like school districts or universities, continue to be valid under current law uh, once that prior, uh, that past of intentional discrimination is found. Um, as a result, focusing on undoing segregation and compensating for underinvestment in uh, majority minority institutions if they remain persistent, um, subject to persistent segregation and inequality following acknowledged or unremedied intentional segregation, that remains valid under the Constitution. Where does this leave us then if the federal government wants to pursue remediation for its role in Jim Crow? Um, if the, a pro, such a program were to be race-based, it sets up a rather daunting list to withstand strict scrutiny. Um, a government can uh, adopt uh, measures to cure its own past intentional discrimination, um, but, and that itself, as I've mentioned, the court has ruled constitutes uh, a compelling interest, so checking off that first test of strict scrutiny. 
Um, the government can't simply declare that discrimination occurred, uh, but it doesn't have to wait for a court to so rule. Um, if a government institution wishes to adopt race-based remedies, it needs a, quote, strong basis in evidence uh, for believing that racial discrimination occurred and requires a current remedy. So documentation is needed. Um, and as to the next step, um, with the government then has to show that whatever it's doing is narrowly tailored to address those harms. Um, the standard for addressing whether racial remedies are narrowly tailored is in fact quite demanding. Recent cases like uh, Parents Involved, which involved a case challenging voluntary school integration in the uh, Seattle and Louisville uh, school districts, uh, struck down racial remedies at that stage of the analysis. Courts generally cite the United States v. Paradise decision, the Alabama State Troopers one I mentioned to you, in judging whether such measures are narrowly tailored. They look at, quote, the necessity for the relief and the efficacy of alternatives, the flexibility and duration of the relief, including the availability of waiver provisions, the relationship of the numerical goals to the relevant market, and the impact of the relief on the rights of third parties. What does this entail in practice? First, it's essential um, a government entity has to consider and most likely experiment with race-neutral remedies first. So if it's seeking to alleviate uh, ongoing inequality, it should look, uh, for example, to class-based remedies. Second, if remediation is the goal, uh, it's essential for this entity to actually focus on the specific groups that were historically discriminated against in that setting. Um, in Croson, the court uh, commented on what it perceived as over-inclusion in the context of Richmond, Virginia, because uh, Spanish-speaking Asian and Native American persons were included in the remedial program. Um, lower court cases uh, addressing contracting set-asides, like those in Richmond and Adir in Croson and Adirond, have also suggested that we need that. Uh, flexibility is key. They don't want rigid quotas. They want um, goals, the ability to show that if the goal can't be met, a waiver can be gotten. Um, further, some means of assessing, calibrating, quantifying in some measure what exactly the harm was and what is needed to match the remedy to that harm uh, is uh, highly regarded by the court. So for example, in historic cases, they spoke favorably of situations where, um, for example, a set number of uh, black officers had been hired, not hired due to discrimination, and in fact, that many slots were reserved for future hiring. Um, finally, the impact of relief. Uh, the court's primary concern here seems, again, to be uh, that this not be rigid. Um, and that it not entails severe impacts on the whites uh, who are excluded from the program. So it struck down plans that led to, say, laying off white workers in the affirmative employment context, um, but was open to ones that would mean white workers were not hired or promoted in the first instance. <sighs> Where does this leave us then in thinking through reparations uh, for federal wrongs? It leaves us with two key points. One, programs that are designed to identify the victims of past discrimination and perhaps their descendants and institutions and communities that uh, were affected, those sorts of targeted programs may not be subject to strict scrutiny at all. Even if the discrimination that they experienced was race-based, the remedy is not in the relevant legal sense. Um, programs that focus on race as a basis for remedies without attempting to identify experiences of past discrimination um, as the basis for the targeting will face much more challenging hurdles. Those can be overcome, but it would require much careful design and supporting research. Um, it's necessary to articulate theories and remedies that match the type of discrimination that occurred to the steps taken to address it, whether those are more backward-looking compensatory remedies or attempts to change who benefits from or is included in a public institution going forward. That suggests that attempts to prospectively change uh, the composition of areas of life or sectors that aren't organized as public institutions, like schools and police departments, will require theoretical work. Um, let me illustrate what I mean with um, a couple of examples. Um, we've had a recent example in which the federal government attempted to address more than a century of discrimination in its programs to support um, uh, its 
what I've already described as that massive set of federal farm programs uh, supporting American farmers um, and their history of race discrimination. The government has recently attempted to overcome that in part with a set of debt relief provisions, um, recognizing that uh, minority farmers are smaller, more economically disadvantaged, um, and are, have disappeared quickly over the last 50 years or so. So in the American Rescue Plan Act, the Biden uh, uh, financial relief package that passed, passed in March, it included a provision providing up to 120% of debt forgiveness for outstanding farm loans uh, held by the terminology used was socially disadvantaged farmer or rancher. In practice, the agency translates that um, to mean uh, members of a group who have been subject to racial or ethnic prejudice because of their identity as members of a group with rega out regard to individual qualities, which is further translated by the agency to mean um, uh, American Indians or Alaskan Natives, African Americans, Asian Americans, Latinos, Native Hawaiians, or other Pacific Islanders. Um, Congress relied specifically on the long history of USDA discrimination in passing these provisions. Um, so it's an example of an attempt at racial repair by the federal government. Notice, however, that they did not attempt to single out specifically um, those had, who had experienced past discrimination, or at least they took a very broad, oops, sorry, a very broad-based approach. Um, instead, essentially offering loan relief to um, all racial minority farmers at present. Um, it's quite possible, of course, that they are experiencing systematic ongoing discrimination and that their race is a proxy for that experience in the present. But under the conservative frameworks, we have courts demand evidence of that. They're unlikely to accept that as a blanket assertion. And so, since this was not targeted to, quote, identified victims, uh, it was subjected to strict scrutiny. A plethora, many, many, uh, nearly a dozen of lawsuits were filed in different places by various conservative uh, legal organizations. Um, who jumped in to sue and seek to enjoy the, enjoying this program on behalf of white farmers who weren't benefiting. Um, and so four courts uh, uh, issued preliminary injunctions in the space of a month uh, in June of this year. They um, applied strict scrutiny in assessing this. Even those courts that were willing, not all of them were, um, to assume a compelling interest in remedying past discrimination. Um, those that acknowledged the overwhelming historical evidence, which was sort of spelled out in the um, federal briefs, but not, not compellingly presented in the way it might have been. Um, even those that granted that found that it wasn't narrowly tailored. It was overly inclusive. Um, they thought they didn't see evidence in what was presented to them that, say, um, uh, Native Hawaiians, they said, had not been apparently subject to USDA farm loan discrimination. Um, Certainly, they have been subject to all sorts of uh, travesties by uh, our national government, but apparently specific evidence as to USDA farm loans wasn't there. Um, they also commented on its under-inclusivity. Those with current loans were getting relief. What about all of those who had not gotten loans, who had already fallen away from the practice of farming, perhaps? Uh, it wasn't calibrated in, a, in amount to any particular uh, theory of harms. It was debt relief, but there was no attempt to assert that this was, in fact, the amount needed to repair uh, the past. So no appeals have been taken from the Justice Department by the Justice Department from those injunctions, most likely because they know that the program is not well designed to withstand constitutional scrutiny, and they don't want to create more negative law in the appellate courts or the Supreme Court. Just to contrast this with one other recent proposal for racial remedies, um, uh, William Darity and Kirsten Mullen, uh, academics at Duke, have proposed a program that would redress slavery and Jim Crow, both um, the uh, hundreds of years of racial subordination. Um, they suggest targeting the descendants of slaves who have identified as black in the last 12 years before the initiation of the program. Um, and they would include individual payments as well as broader investments uh, uh, in institutions and uh, uh, social programs, uh, all of them calibrated to a total amount intended to close the racial wealth gap. So how would this potentially fare? It's targeted to address the descendants of those affected by slavery. It might um, quite easily meet a compelling interest in remedying past discrimination. Uh, 
the devil would be in the details. Is it narrowly tailored? Um, is it tailored enough? The total amount is set at closing the racial wealth gap. Um, it's unclear to what extent those payments will flow to individuals um, and if a court would find they were sufficiently calibrated. It would also be under-inclusive. What about later immigrants to the United States, um, African Americans who experienced Jim Crow but not slavery, one example. Um, but at least it does suggest a path towards targeting remedies that might not trigger at all or at least might withstand constitutional scrutiny um, by the current uh, conservative federal courts if these remedies are closely enough matched to those who suffered the relevant harms. So stepping back, um, just to flag for those who may not, uh, you may have simply assumed this from the presentation to this point, um, if we're thinking about the possibilities of repair for the federal wrongs, uh, the federal involvement in Jim Crow that I outlined, there's very limited possibilities that you could actually sue, go to court and sue and get a court to issue uh, legal remedies for those wrongs. Um, there's many procedural barriers to, successive li uh, to successful litigation now, also a result of the conservative dominance of the courts. Um, and there's also substantive questions. While the courts embraced the idea that federal approval and funding of Jim Crow violated the Constitution uh, through the 1980s, um, asking the current Supreme Court to return to that question might produce a different result. The only recent suit to achieve even partial success on such claims was filed in the 1990s by uh, black families living in public housing in Baltimore. Um, in 2005, the district court uh, held that the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, which had participated along with state and local authorities in producing segregation in, in Baltimore public housing and beyond, uh, that it had violated the Fair Housing Act. Um, but the court just refused to decide the kind of more sweeping constitutional claim, the one that I outlined in the talk. Um, and in 2012, the case settled. So there's very limited, uh, limited precedent for thinking that courts would order any remedies now. What about voluntary federal remedies? What might a court uphold, if not order, what might it uphold against inevitable conservative attacks? Um, acknowledging uh, and thinking a bit about the scope of what such a program might entail, while acknowledging that it wouldn't be uh, complete reparations, it would be focused on the federal role in Jim Crow, it wouldn't address the prior harms of slavery, nor subsequent harms like mass incarceration. Um, it would exclude the experiences of other groups um, to the extent that they that insufficient documentary evidence could be assembled about their exposure uh, to Jim Crow. Um, what this might look like would simply be to accept, assemble the evidence of past discrimination in excruciating detail, to identify all of the federal programs that knowingly subsidize segregation across the sectors I discussed, and trace their impacts, identify affected individuals and their descendants today, affected institutions, and affected communities in the cases uh, where um, uh, in practices like uh, segregated housing and redlining, um, it's obviously communities as a whole that are affected, and target uh, calibrated remedies to those groups. The hope would be that those uh, might in fact not be subject to strict scrutiny at all or might not be overturned in the courts. Um, what would, this is, I, you know, I can only even begin to kind of hint at what the massive um, investments that would be required to design such a program, specific, beyond the political capital that, as we all know, is not yet available. The political capital required to mount such a program is massive. Um, to to support such a, such a program against legal onslaught, it would also require a lot of knowledge, a lot of documentation, a lot of work, detailed evidence, and careful planning. Um, my own uh, working theory is that this is a role that we would want the federal agencies uh, led by the US Commission on Civil Rights to take on themselves. Um, to go deeply into their own archives, identify the individuals, institutions, and communities affected by their practices, um, and to begin to design measures for relief. Um, 
those even such remedies uh, would be very partial. Uh, as I've discussed, the Constitution creates massive barriers to anything like full reparations um, were we uh, to even imagine the minimum that I laid out in terms of the broad brushstrokes of what uh, a program of racial repair might encompass. Um, it would not include the memory and truth-telling the United States still has yet to really embrace. Um, to backstop a program of targeted racial reparations, I think you need, inevitably, so many people would go untouched by that. You also need redistributive equality guarantees for children and families, essentially to shore up and deepen uh, the social welfare state that was that was bought at the price of accepting Jim Crow back in the back in the New Deal years. It might also require us to rethink governance more deeply, something that for now I can only wave my hands at. Um, but if you think about it, much of the 20th century structure of modern governance that was created in those New Deal bargains, the way in which the federal government uh, creates programs, creates institutions, plugs resources um, and rules into different sectors of national life, um, that in itself persists in many forms today and continues to entrench uh, political power and resources. So in the end, an ideal program, I think, needs to rethink uh, those laws, institutions, and legacies. Uh, and I have talked at you for a very long time, and I will stop now. I look forward to your questions or comments, <laughs> thoughts. You don't have to say anything, though. Channing. Great presentation, Joy. Um, my takeaway as a non-lawyer is that um, there it's disappointing to that there's so that the the ways forward are so limited um in terms of you know speaking as a black american um and i wonder and i think about you know uh, current movements for reparations for slavery and and other things and and part of what's Part of the motivation to join that movement is this, you know, it's 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 a kind of um, it's it's a vision for how things could be in the future, and uh, sort of in a way utopian, but also, I mean, you need that sort of idealism to get people to join movements sometimes. And I wonder, is there a way to sexify this in a, <laughs> so that you can get people uh, to get behind it? I may not be the best judge of what is sexy, considering that I'm thinking back over the years. I gave a sixth grade talk on like the Chamber of Commerce or something. I don't know. Um, sexy. I. I mean, I think that those movements, their goals go so far beyond, as you said, what I said the Constitution and the current federal courts would allow. Um, but the sexiness lies, obviously, in projecting that utopian vision, because ultimately. It just takes a really long time, but you change those governing institutions, right? Like the reason we had that burst of energy, albeit for the 15 year period of the war in court was democratic dominance. I mean, it's complicated because of that coalition and who was included in the democratic coalition, right? Um, Southern Democrats, but FDR, Truman, those appointments, um, Kennedy, uh, though the appointments of that era created a constitution, a different constitutional regime. And it's just what, what's frustrating is that, of course, the institutional, the energy required to take over our institutions as they're designed is so far beyond majoritarian at this point. That's what's hard. But um, I, yeah, I think the future <sighs> reparations are obviously part of it, but if you restructure governing institutions and create redistributive guarantees, I think that that is so much of the ball game that that's the sexiest part. It's like creating a vision of a different a society in which. Um, What's the slogan, though? <laughs> 
don't know. Help. <laughs> I mean, the it was a joke. You don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your talk. It's uh, it's a bit depressing. <laughs> and uh, I wonder whether this uh, the tests you showed us of, of strict sc uh, scrutiny have ever been met. Uh, <laughs> because <laughs> not, not recently. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, it, it, it looks odd to me to ask for... Uh, evidence of former discrimination, um, the lack of documentation of keeping records was part of the discrimination. And, and so it, it, it's a vicious circle. And, and that, that sounds cynical to me to, to ask this kind of, of proof. Right. I mean, the further back we reach, you know, archival history, um, you know, segregation and Jim Crow are like very, uh, uh, you know, administrative enterprises. So there actually are relatively well documented, right? You know, it's, it's, it requires a big bureaucracy to kind of create that, that apartheid regime. Um, but I hear you. It is sort of a, um, it's got huge limitations built into it in the sense that governments that wish to embrace programs like this, in some ways it seems so like a dumb moment, you know, there's massive evidence of intentional discrimination across all these sectors, but governments, you know, even at a remove, I think don't want to embrace and acknowledge that history. Um, and it is in fact, uh, I, I, I was recently reading a scholar who was arguing that in fact, um, these programs do get designed as sort of more perspective um, remedies aimed at a broad variety of groups because, in fact, to kind of acknowledge discrimination and target it appropriately is just politically um, un unpalatable. So I think I've reinforced the depressing nature of the conversation because it suggests the major, I, you know, this was about legal barriers, but there, there are obviously serious political barriers as well. Okay, I'm on, on Barra Kemper. I'm teaching uh, modern history at the Free University of Berlin. And I have been wondering, I mean, uh, thanks for your most interesting talk in the first place. Um, I was wondering if to what extent and how the recent debate on human rights has had an impact on processes of and discussions about remedying racial segregation. Uh, would you like to argue that it had a positive impact? Uh, or no impact at all, two different issues, or did it serve as a, was it a kind of impediment to discussion and processes of uh, repair? Do you mean like just global human rights discussions writ large? Yes, or? in particular with regard to minorities and in particular to, with regard to racial minority, minorities and racial segregation and persecution. I mean, I think that um, it's sort of a double-edged sword. Uh, African Americans and other minorities within the United States, you know, for, for decades, reaching back to the mid-20th century, have called upon inter international human rights law, international organizations, um, as external judges of the injustices they've suffered and drawn upon a, that as a resource. But that's just another kind of, um, you know, it, it's been less in the news lately, but it's been kind of a long-term push of conservatives on our Supreme Court to deem any form of international law or influence as kind of verboten and totally outside the realm of acceptable U.S. jurisprudential sources. So um, I think it's... it's uh, like everything else, it has that, that valence where uh, opponents can, can use it to their detriment. Yes, good evening. Uh, Ralf Gütersloh from the German Insurance Association. Um, I've been working for over 20 years on um, Holocaust compensation and a lot of topics that you raised sound very familiar to me. Um, so 
I mean, after more than 20 years, we're only talking about a small matter, measure of justice um, on that topic. And I was wondering if you would recommend for the area you presented tonight, if you have a, a favorite memory, you, you mentioned monetary compensation, reparations, monuments, um, discussions, moral compensations, that's how we call it. Mm -hmm. Is there any preference that you would see as the least difficult to accomplish and the most difficult in what particular order? Thank you. Until recently, I would have thought that truth-telling was the lowest bar, but, you know, to discuss, um, we have state laws now that have been enacted that bar at teaching topics that will make children feel discomfort uh, related to their racial identity. So um, truth-telling is, you know, now apparently hard, harder than, than, I, than I once thought. Um, as uh, the na naive white liberal that I apparently was um, and may still be. Uh, but I mean, truth telling can be done by anyone, right? The threshold for entry into the public domain is at least open, right? This work can be done by private individuals. We don't always need kind of official embrace of those things. So I think it is obviously key um, and I really, you know, I, I, I joked at the beginning about uh, my interactions with Richard Rothstein when I first met him, but I can't but marvel at the impact of his book, The Color of Law, that was this project and which has kind of changed public memory, at least for those reading those books, um, in a massive way. So I think I, I, maybe I will stick by that as kind of the minimalist threshold. Um, I think that... The most, the most important is to redistribute political power going forward, but obviously the hardest. Um, and that might be achieved in part by things like redistributive equality guarantees, but it's a, it's a catch-22 because um, how do we enact such measures without the political power in the first place? So um, it is the problem, as always, of... Um, uh, of of those without much political power trying to kind of start a revolution. That's, I think that's the high end of the, of the bar. Alec, I saw your hand up. Um, I was just curious what you uh, make of, made of that Medicaid expansion decision in, by the Supreme Court in 20, whatever, 2012, when they upheld Obamacare but struck down the Medicaid expansion. You, expansion. you mentioned it early on in the talk, and I found that especially frustrating because there was an attempt by the federal government to help people, especially help people of color, in states that had not been, where, where the state governments had left them uninsured because they you know, didn't, just didn't care about the problem, basically. And the federal government tried to deal with it in a in that case, in a colorblind way of just saying, um, we're just going to expand Medicaid for everybody and it's going to disproportionately help people of color in these states where that have had lots of uninsured, where the state government just didn't do anything about it. And so you had to, there was, you're trying to just go at it that way. And, um, and, but of course the, the court struck it down, uh, I guess on article 10 grounds, right? That it was, that it was, you were forcing the states to accept the money in a sense, and the states should still have the right to not accept the money. And a lot of them have not, and it's been terrible. And it's had a huge effect on all these people who've remained uninsured, heavily disproportionately uh, minority. And, and that ruling of course had two democratic nominee votes in favor of it. Um, Breyer and Kagan voted in favor of that ruling. And I was just wondering how people see that ruling. You know, was that sort of correctly decided or, or you know, was, so how do, how do we deal with that? Like where the federal government can't even try to expand Medicaid or do something like that, something very generous essentially for, if, if you're gonna have the court saying, no, you can't make the states accept the money. Right, I mean, it's part of a long-term um, a thread of, you know, conservative embrace of federal, of states' rights, essentially. Um, and so that's seen, 
in a strange way, if the knock on that New Deal bargain that I said was, you know, you're giving federal money to accomplish, to create Leviathan, conservatives call it Leviathan, right? The administrative state, the social welfare state. Um, and for decades, you know, it was thought that there was no effective limit to what the federal government could do with that um, kind of power of federal funding. Um, I think that I, I, you know, I think that like Kagan Breyer votes, you, it's hard to unpack that because you don't know what kind of log rolling and strategic things are happening yeah. um, inside the court. Uh, but I don't, I, I don't even know if we can think about it as right or wrong, to be mm -hmm. honest. There are areas of law where there's right and wrong, but I think that kind of that kind of structural question of the balance of federal power and the meaning, if any, of the Tenth Amendment as an independent constraint on kind of how we construct the relative ba balance of federal state power, that's like probably the most mal uh, least amenable to correct, incorrect mm -hmm. answers. It's just yeah. a judgment. Maybe it's one based on deep political and legal philosophy, but it's still a judgment. Yeah. Bergeril. So um, in the video, Richard Rothstein describes this kind of special 15-year period of the court that ends in 69. But in your presentation, you describe an interesting 10-year period that occurs after 69, in which the court is... Um, making decisions that are protective of civil rights. And it's a conservative court. Um, can we draw any lessons from that era for the current one, where we have a conservative court right now, in terms of any sort of note of optimism or possibility with respect to a court willing to recognize or acknowledge uh, racial harms and um, allow for remediation? Yeah, um, I mean, I think that they are so, I think that the benefit of uh, political insulation, the lifetime tenure of the Supreme Court, which may or may not be a good thing on net, but it this insulation um, gives them room to actually respond to pressures that don't emanate directly from uh, their particular part of the electorate or the president that appointed them as part of the electorate. So I think, you know, um, I think Black Lives Matter protests shape even conservative justices' understanding of the world. I think, you know, Me Too shapes understandings of the world. I think these things do have the ability to shift. Um, the problem is that even if you think someone like Roberts, you might detect incremental jurisprudential John Roberts um, changing slightly uh, over the years that he's been on the court, um, there's even, you know, when I teach civil procedure, there's two cases that I teach that have to do with just arcane civil procedure, but are really about police stops of unarmed um, young black men and, and violence in those stops uh, practiced against those um, young black men. You know, there's like a, almost like a, a big shift in the way Roberts is describing these things post uh, Trayvon Martin um, and those incidents. So I think it has like small, it, it's not much to kind of pin your hopes on, but I do think that that matters. I mean, the, the 70s I would chalk up to the Republican coalition hadn't, the realignment to be kind of anti-civil rights hadn't been perfected as of then. Jacqueline. Thank you. If the ex effort to expand Medicaid uh, uh, to, uh, to the states uh, that were reluctant to do so had been cast as a form of uh, remedy, as, a, as a, a remedial measure to undo federal financing of segregationist uh, uh, state institutions, do you think it would have had a better chance of succeeding? Wow, that's an amazing theory, and you've kind of blown my mind. I love it, but I, I'm not sure. It would be a novel uh, theory that, a, um, that we could use kind of a remedial purpose to overcome federalism constraints. It would be sort of, I guess, a 14th Amendment. You might claim that, um, you know, that it's based on Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, Congress's power to enforce equal protection. Um, which we know does overcome the federalism constraints that occurred in the original 
constitution. So it has some promise. It's really interesting. Uh, I have to think about it more. Thank you for suggesting that. Mm -hmm. um, great talk. So um, a very naive question. Uh, you know, racism and slavery were a global phenomenon, not, not merely a, a U.S. phenomenon. Um, and the issue of repair is also in some ways a global phenomenon, and it's quite interesting to contrast efforts at repair uh, for slavery and discrimination, uh, segregation and the like, uh, with those that are being enacted dealing with um, you know, indigenous populations in whether it's Canada, Australia, whatever. I'm just curious if, any, if you know of any other uh, societies, any other countries that are grappling with um, uh, the sequelae of, of slavery and segregation and whether any of them have done anything interesting. I mean, in South Africa, of course, we have truth and reconciliation, so the, 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 the entry-level stuff. Right. Um, I don't know. And I mean, the interesting thing about South Africa comes to mind as the place that has, you know, apartheid, right? So because it's not just slavery, you know, it's just like the compounding of uh, severe inequality over kind of our um, more recent history, too. Um, but of course, the difference is that, you know, um, majoritarian political power it doesn't apparently buy you as much as we might have hoped in South Africa, but it, it buys you something. It, it gets you the, the truth and reconciliation and promises for land reform, if not apparently much of that either. Um, no, I, in many of the countries where, you know, if you, that come to mind um, are, are less white dominant countries that you think of, like, you know, other countries in the Western Hemisphere that had plantation slavery, for instance. Um, so it's hard to think of an exact equivalent. Or even an effort. Or an effort. Yeah. On that cheery note. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it.